You're listening to Mystic Magic, and I'm your host, Reverend Celeste A. Frazier. Today is going to be a great show. I'm calling it Super Soul Friday, because today my guest is Reverend Derek B. Wells. He is an author, artist, corporate CEO, and the senior minister of Christ Universal Temple. He is fun and fabulous. Stay tuned. This is Mystic Magic, exploring our spirit to understand our lives. Hey, hey, Mystic Magic fans. We are here with Reverend Derek Wells today. And Reverend Derek is a Chicago native with a doctorate in education. He's an author and artist, a corporate CEO, and the senior minister of the Christ Universal Temple in Chicago. He's a contemporary man of God whose story is one of radical redemption. His process of redemption has played a major role in his commitment to teaching people how to transform their lives. It's the manifestation of the vision God gave him to help build individuals, families, and communities through the power of love, the pursuit of happiness, and the application of self-determination. Derek's journey to ministry draws from his own personal life of encountering challenges as an adolescent in the inner city of Chicago. In his words, he was unchurched and in search of something, but he found his way to Christ Universal Temple, and he found that it was a place that could help him change and become better. And so uh, five years after Reverend Johnny Coleman's retirement, official retirement, Reverend Derek was selected by the congregation as the senior minister of CUT. As a leader and a teacher with an unquenchable thirst for excellence and achievement to see the potential of God and the emergence of Christ in all humanity. Welcome, Reverend Derek. So good to have you here. Thank you for having me uh, to the Mystic Magic family. I'm excited to be with you. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our time together tonight. I, I'm excited. I'm excited. I think this is going to be good. I love it because you're always excited. And <laughs> one of the things that I know about you is that you have had this journey of challenges, shall we say? That's fair. And so what is the story of redemption that has got you committed to transform people's lives? Uh, so as you kind of just read in, in my bio, my story is not that dissimilar from, uh, from, from many young urban males, right? We come up and we, and we sort of begin to, to, to make assumptions about what's available to us what sort of roads we, we might be able to take out of the situations we find ourselves in. And like, I firmly believe all of us have an urge within us to, to be better uh, than the station we find ourselves in, whatever that station. So whether we're uh, supremely successful or quote unquote at the bottom of the rung, still just trying to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Like I, I firmly believe that there is something in us, innate to each and every one of us, that's just trying to pull us to the next great expression of ourselves. And so uh, like, like many young black men from the hood, you know, I found myself being essentially raised by the streets. And uh, never mind that my, that my mom told me, you know, you, you can go a different route. Like one of the things I'm, I'm eternally grateful for uh, when it comes to my mom is like, she never ever burdened me with this notion of what I could not do or what I could not be. And so, like, I, I do have a naivete and a hubris when it comes to what, what I'm capable of, just because my mother never said, like, you're not smart enough, you're not tall enough, you're, you're not masculine enough, you're not enough. She never put that on me. And so the decisions that I made that led me uh, into street life and into a life of crime, like, I can, I can Celeste, remember those being my conscious decisions. Like, I can remember choosing to, to try and take over a block. Like I can remember choosing that trying to win in the drug game was the way I was gonna go. Like those were conscious, deliberate, intentional decisions. Um, 
Now the challenge is, I didn't think through to the end of like what the results typically are when you when you make those kind of decisions. So I was conscious of the decision, but I was not conscious of the consequence, right? And so uh, as I started to meet the consequences of my decisions, I started looking to try and make some different decisions, right? And so um, that's really the, the crux of my journey, thinking my way into trouble and then thinking my way into transformation. That's, that's really my journey right there. Okay. All right. Now, from time to time, I hear little indicators about the things you used to plot to do, and you seem a little bit kind of removed from that person. What have you learned about who that person is now that you are a different being? Well, you know, it's so funny because um, I like, and this is kind of what I'm going to call like the blessing and curse of transformation. Like people who, who only see me in, in this now state, like I, like I really get a kick out of their denial about who I used to be. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like no, you, could, you couldn't have been that. I can't see you that way. Um, which, which on the one hand, I like, I think really does speak to the, the transformative capacity of the soul, right? So that, that you could so thoroughly change yourself. You could so thoroughly realign your energy. You could so thoroughly, uh, re rewire yourself that you can create so much distance between, between who you are and who you used to be. And like, it's one of the things that I, that I think gives us the, the ability to stand in our greatness despite our past, but just just being able being able to to not abandon the process, right? Being able to see the the bricks that those past experiences and those uh, past challenges. Being able to see uh, how my leadership style developed out of my activity in in my previous life, like I often refer to it as my previous life. You know, but just being being able to to see the the lines and the correlations between between this other version of myself and who who I am becoming, and also just recognizing the ability to to bring that along with you is like like even more more now. I I find myself rediscovering myself because. Like you can you can lose yourself in anything, Celeste. Like you you can lose yourself in the identity of the pastorate or the identity of your leadership or the identity of your relationships. And so, like I like I find myself in some ways having to put myself back together in in the true integrity and awareness of of who I am and how I see myself outside of how other folks see me or how they think I should be just because that's more authentic to me, right? And so just being able to bring all of those elements, all of those parts and love all of myself, love all of my journey and to be able to honor and appreciate all of what has gone into helping to bring me to this place so that I could be um, a force for good in my life and to be active in my own rescue uh, and also so that I could support others in being able to, to do the same, to be a force in their own lives and to be active in their own rescue. Okay. You know, it's something interesting about transformation that, that we can't even begin to understand in this human mind. But, you know, there's, there's obviously a transformative energy that we're in right now. The person currently occupying the White House called our military losers and suckers. Uh -huh. And, you know, that's never been done before. And I'm hoping that this is allowing that, any of those thoughts to be purged from our collective consciousness, because we know that this is the farthest thing from the truth about our military uh -huh. personnel. How did your service in the U.S. Navy contribute to your spiritual maturity? So, so let me, let me, can I just touch that, that piece first? Um, sure, sure. And so, so like, I, I think it's, I think it's critical for us um, to, to one, just recognize that, of course, that perspective is not the prevailing perspective 
of, uh, over, of the overwhelming people in this country, right? The overwhelming majority of people in this country have a great deal of regard, esteem, and honor for the women and men who serve, who serve in our armed, armed forces, uh, whether that's uh, currently or, or in the past, right? We, we, we honor our veterans, we honor our service members. And so that is not the, the prevailing thought of the majority of people. Uh, second, I think it's important to recognize when people are projecting their own sense of self onto, onto things that they intentionally avoided. You know what I'm saying? Like, Amen. like, you, like, yes. like it, it's, it's, and, and like, I, you know, I get, I get the, what the media has to play up. Um, but like, why would, why would we ever listen? to someone who went out of their way to dodge service. Like, why would we honor their opinion? Like, why does that opinion even matter? And I get that the opinion is expressed by someone who is in a particular role, but it's also yes. incumbent upon us as intellectual, analytical people to just be able to, to, to let noise be be noise because that's just yeah. that's just a bunch of noise that's coming from someone who could not whether it's muster the courage or or find the wherewithal to make the muster like whatever it is or just wasn't in just wasn't in but but it's like he certainly he certainly demonstrates a great deal of appreciation for the demonstration of military might like, so there's a, like, there's a lot of admiration there, but you couldn't mm -hmm. find it within yourself to be able to step into it. And so really, mm -hmm. when you, when you talk about losers and suckers, like you're not talking about the men and women who said yes, you're probably talking about the person who couldn't find the wherewithal to do what it is they're criticizing, right? So there's, there's a, I, I can't think of who, who, who it was. The, qu the quote is not coming to me, so I, I'm, I'm going to keep moving. Uh, but to, to answer your question, in terms of my military service and how it prepared me for uh, kind of the roles I see myself in now, and even like in some of my coaching work and things like that, Celeste, and you would probably, you, you would probably believe this, but it was really ironic to, for me to be 20 years old at the time uh, that I went in. So I, I, was, I, I went in at age 20. I came out at uh, just almost age 24. And it was one of the most spiritually enlightened times in my early life, certainly up to that point. Almost the entire time that I was in the Navy, I actually practiced Islam. And uh, I would find myself leading the prayers. Uh, it, it, oftentimes, we would be overseas and overseas uh, if we were able to find a mosque, the, um, the, like the, the, the people I would go with to the mosque would task me with leading the prayer uh, at 20, 21 years old uh, to have young couples come to me for counseling, right? To be 20, 21 years old and to have a shipmate who has a wife or a girlfriend who he's comfortable with her coming to my room so I can talk with her about them. You know what I'm saying? Like that's like that's that's not common. Right? right. That's 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 not common. But those sorts of things would happen to me often. Like D, you got it. So they my lots of my shipmates called me D. And D, you you got a minute was like it that almost became my my new nickname, right? Mm -hmm. Um just because when 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 they needed an you know an opportunity to unplug somebody uh, to talk to them somebody to help them recalibrate somebody to coach them up more often than not my my door was the door that my shipmates knocked on or their significant others knocked on to say like man what do you think can you help me and those were like those are really some of the 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 earliest opportunities. Uh, the earliest untrained opportunities that I got to be like a practitioner in counseling and and things like that and like I said in coaching um, and just doing what I could to uh, share some sort of insight to help the person be better on the other side of our conversation than they were before we began. 
Um, and I'm, I'm telling you, Rev, if it, if it happened, if it happened once, it happened a hundred times. And some of those people, even to this day, when we, when we talk, I, I had one of my good shipmates call me not long ago and like, man, you know, I'm just calling to, to check in with you, but what do you think about this? Or man, I'm having this challenge. And so it was really sort of some of the foundational work, I believe, for uh, that would serve as a catalyst for the one of the next phases of my life that was that was upcoming. So somebody spotted your light, huh? Somebody <laughs> did. And, and what's, somebody. Like, what's ironic is is I, I I didn't see it myself, you know. I and I've like I've there's leadership has always been one of the things that was natural for me, and people have always felt comfortable talking to me, but but I but I never really processed it as a giftedness, right? And, you know, and I, I get all the time that, I, that I'm a, a good listener and all that. But again, I never processed that as a, as a giftedness. Um, I just, you, you mentioned earlier about teaching people how to teach people. Uh, I just thought it was, was the way you were supposed to treat people, right? So I, I just kind of did it out of, out of what was natural to me. Your name? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, we have heard and seen images of young black men having a target on them, if you will. And I know you're the father of a young black man. Like, how do you marry your street smarts and your spiritual truth to guide and support him in these troubled times? Yeah, so, so one of the things, uh, just from a very practical perspective, one of the very practical things that I, that I try and uh, help him to do it. And, and like my kid is a, is a, is a good kid, smart kid, not, not street smart, but, but wily, <laughs> like wily in, in his approaches to things, you know, and so he's, and, and he also has, he also, he's got a good disposition, good de dis demeanor. And so, you know, he's like, he's an easy person to, to get along with. He's an easy person to be around. And one of the things that I try and help him to understand, and, and I got this from Reverend Sheila McKeithen, Sheila McKeithen some time ago, is that when, if ever, you find yourself in being pulled over, the, the goal for you at that time is just to be able to make it home after the end of the stop. Yes. Right? That's, that, that's your goal. You want to be comfortable enough to be able to get back home. You want the officer or officers to be comfortable enough to get back home, uh, like no sudden movements, no back talk. And this is not really like this is not really who he is. As a matter of fact, he, before we before we moved into the into the home uh, that that my wife and I live in now, uh, my wonderful was having parties at our house. Um, and one after about the third party, the police called called our home, and I like uh, Mr. and Mrs. Wells. Your son and some of his friends are uh, at what we understand is your new house having parties. And they're not doing anything. They're good kids. But we just need to now put you on notice because we have to hold you responsible, right? So, so like, the pol he, he, he's, he's in the wrong. And the police called the house saying, like, he's a good kid. They're not doing anything wrong. Uh, but we just need to put you on notice. So he's, he's that kind of kid. Um, but to answer your question, like, the, the, the goal, my goal for him, uh, just like really the goal for any of us should be uh, not to prove ourselves right in that moment, not to litigate the question in that moment, but to be able to make it back home safely to the people we love and then give uh, the day in court, if it should come to that, the opportunity to determine uh, who was right and who was wrong. But that's, that's, really, that's really the main objective when, when it comes to, to the possibility of, of my son being stopped, particularly during, during these times? Well, it's, it just seems to be only necessary for people with certain skin tones, so. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not even a conversation if you're not Black. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, like, that's, yeah, it's, well, it's, you know, and, and part of the reason that I mentioned it, because somebody had told me, well, you know, one, one time you said something about, well, you know, my son is prayed up, so we don't have to worry about it. 
And so somebody challenged you or something about that and said, you know, what if the other person's not prayed up yeah. or something? Yeah, that, that was that was my son. That was my that was my son who so when shortly after the uh, George Floyd uh, murder and you know my so my son saw the uh, the protests that were happening downtown Chicago and you know he, he kind of he called me and said you know like kind of, you you guys okay and I'm like yeah yeah we're fine um, he like are you going to the protest I'm like not today and he's like but but you're gonna go at some point right I'm like yeah absolutely he's you know like you should make sure you do that and I'm no problem I'm, I'm with it I'm going if you were here we could go together and uh, he's like so like so what if that were you or I and you know I, I gave him I gave him like the great Christian metaphysician answer right yep we're we, we're prayed up we're we're covered um, the the energy field is around us like all of the all of the great platitudes that we that we tell ourselves to yes be in alignment with with the truth that we know uh, but to also give ourselves a sense of ease as we are seeing so much dis-ease right and so he would yeah he wouldn't he wouldn't let me cop that out and he really he really threw me a curveball when he said well you know like okay wonderful like i know you've prayed for me my whole life you prayed with me my whole life and yes i can buy that we're covered but what about my friend because while I, you know and like I've, I've watched these boys grow up into into young men they went to prom from my home is and it's been great to see them go from grammar school children to graduating college and he he paused me because I could unfortunately see a scenario where one kid is in normal Illinois, one kid is in another part of Southern Illinois. They're young men in Iowa, like the young men in Indiana. They go through Indiana when they're going to other colleges, and unfortunately, I could like I could imagine a scenario. And when when he forced me to deal with the possibility of the scenario it just made it more real for me right so he's like because it could happen to my friend it could happen to he, he mentioned reverend galen who who's known him uh, all of his life and he's like and, you know he called him by his government name like it could happen what if it happened to caleb what did that if it happened to galen I'm like man like that that would not be cool <laughs> you, you know and so it, it just it just forced me to uh to also just re evaluate what what engagement looked like for for me uh, i mean like and i'm still i'm still reticent when it comes to pushing the ministry in that direction but just on a personal level from the per standpoint of my personal engagement you know let's do what we have to do in order to be a part of the solution yeah yeah now in your book, Guidelines for a Master, you pull from the martial arts film, The Last Dragon, for some reference points. So can you speak to the art and the practice of centering before engaging in a major challenge? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like one of the examples I love is the example of uh, Jesus getting word that Lazarus has died. And uh, you know, there's, there's this urgent request for him to come and you know either do what he can or just be with the family like maybe there's nothing you can do but if if you're here reverend celeste everything will be better right you you you've got those kind of calls and so but it was striking to see jesus's reaction because his reaction was not equal to the news that he got right his reaction was was one of a delayed centered awareness that whether I am here or there, God is. Yes. Right. And so when it when it comes to when it comes to allowing uh, oneself to 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 be centered, when it comes to the discipline and the intentionality with which we enter into those moments that are intense, or those moments that are painful, or those moments that have some components of fear to them or those moments that challenge us or stretch us or uh, cause us to experience some sort of emotional turmoil, 
it's 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 great to be able to ground ourselves in in our personal place of peace so that that grounding can be what keeps us if we're entering into the storm. As a matter of fact, like right now we're we're teaching the eye of the storm, Gary Simmons' eye of the storm. And like I just I just love the notion that in the center of the turmoil, in the center of the confusion, uh, in the center of the whirlwind of the demands of life, there is this calm, there is this stillness, there is this peace. And so bringing myself to that single place gives me the opportunity to find the resolution, the steadfastness, and the peace that I need. Because one of the things that we often overlook is that when our emotions get hijacked, our creativity gets hijacked, right? And so the, the ability to navigate the experience creatively is often upset when I go in emotionally hot, right? Mm -hmm. But if I go in grounded, centered, peace-filled, connected, then I open up all of the other resources that are available to me, and those resources are at my disposal and ready to be put to use and unleashed on the opportunity that's in front of me, right? Irrespective of the nature of the opportunity. So why is it imp important to, to get to center? It's important to get to center because that's where your resources are. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't have to go through the thing with armed with the challenge. You can go through it armed with the resources of omnipotence. And yeah. all of that is at our disposal and ready to be brought to bear on the opportunity, right? And so yeah. when I center myself, I, I give myself an opportunity to plug into the flow that is ready to meet the opportunity. Like I am that I am. I will be what the moment demands. Stilling myself allows me to plug into the awareness that whatever I need, I already have. It's already done. It's already met. Yeah. That mastery is something perhaps they could use in the police academy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So I was going to say, if we, if we want, when... So that is how they approach it when they are a part of the communities they police, right? When, mm -hmm. when that, is, that is the approach when the neighbors and the people in the community uh, generally tend to, to look like the, the people they're there to serve, right? Or when they've grown up, like a couple of officers that I either grew up with or have relationship with, like, and to see them police those communities, they police those communities in much the same ways that they were when they grew up in those communities, right? So they are not strangers to the community. They are not the military force that's sent in to keep inmates in order. They are members of the community. And as members of the community, we tend to approach the community differently when we're a part of that community, right? No, like, no different than then if you're visiting someplace, like you, you might have a different approach and mindset to a place that you're visiting than you have to a place that you live in, you know? And so uh, I agree that it's really just a matter, it's, it's a matter of the mental approach that, that's being brought into the service, you know? But when you, when you respect the people you are there to serve, that respect shows up. And I imagine, that, that officers see, see some of the worst demonstrations we can, we can wrap our minds around. And so being indoctrinated so consistently in that, and everybody's got a story, and uh, just seeing the quote-unquote worst of what uh, people are capable of can begin to color how you see people. But, you, but we absolutely see that there's the ability to separate because again, when we go in certain other areas, we don't take that same mentality with us. So we know, like we know how to separate the wheat from the chafe, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Well, my dad was a cop and my brother was a cop. And uh, so I've been around a lot of policemen. My nephew's a police officer now. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's changed over the years too. Some parts have for black officers and 
very low degrees, but mm -hmm. they still have to deal with the inner prejudice too. Sure, sure. But, you know, this is all part of this transformation. I'm calling it all part of the transformation because like whatever's coming up for us to heal is here. Mm -hmm. front and center. That's correct. That's right. That's right. Now you, you came to CUT as a younger adult and then you grew into a spiritual vibration that led you to be the senior minister of Christ Universal Temple. Now I've seen some of the challenges and I've also had some similar challenges in stepping into a pulpit previously occupied by a well-known figure. But in your case, the Reverend Johnny Mae Coleman is both a Chicago legacy and a new thought and metaphysical icon. How have you arisen so triumphantly in mastering your role as the spiritual leader of CUT? So, so I, think there, I think there are three things in particular. The first, I think, is to continue, and, and I'm, I'm saying this from the context of, let's say, someone particularly in a church setting, someone who is uh, stepping into the role of, of giving leadership to a ministry. And whether, like, whether you are replacing an icon or someone who was there for a handful of years, Reverend Celeste, you know as well as I do, the, the connections that are made between ministers and their congregations, like those ties um, even even in the midst of oh, whatever church dysfunction there is, those those ties are are significant, right? And they can run deep, and the differences can the, that the the tide there can be uh, torrential. But one of the first things I think that's vitally important is a a renewed commitment and a renewed license to continue to unearth your authentic self. Like, who are you in this role, right? Not who are you succeeding, uh, not who did you used to be, but give yourself permission to, to, to evolve into the truest, purest sense of who you are in that role. Like, wh who you are is enough. But pretending to be something, someone else, somebody else, like that will never get it. I mean, fortunately for me, uh, before, before I was actually ever uh, even the senior minister at CUT, uh, Reverend Coleman was considering hiring me, hiring me onto her staff. And uh, this is after one Good Friday service, she brought me back into her office and uh, she sat me down for this conversation. She was, you know, she had already let me know that she was thinking about hiring me and bringing me on to be a part of the staff. And, um, you know, she says, well, what's it going to take? I'm like, well, um, right now in my marketplace life, this is, this is where I am. I don't, I, I, I like, I'm not anticipating taking a step back from that. Like that's, that's been developed by right of consciousness. And, you know, so that's a fair baseline. And she said to me, well, we don't pay that here. Um, and, you know, so the conversation continued to evolve. But at some point, we got to one of the things I believe I was supposed to get from that conversation. Uh, she said to me, don't try to do what I do. She said, you can't do what I do. Right. And I had no context for that statement when she said it to me then. I, I'm, I'm only able to appreciate it now that there's so much institutional pressure to maintain the, the greatness and the glory of what is the imprint of Dr. Coleman, right? But the fact of the matter is we have to be content to let that be yesterday. And we have to... I have to be courageous enough to keep pushing myself and pushing the organization because there is no way that I can lead us back into that, right? Mm -hmm. That came out of a particular awareness, a particular consciousness, a particular being. Well, that's not my consciousness. That's not my awareness. That's not my being. That's not my background. That's not my blueprint. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like I didn't grow up 
with those same impressions, which means I see it differently. <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? And so in seeing it differently and then giving myself permission to be in integrity with who I am as I am becoming in the role is key. I think one of the second key things is just who you have around you, right? In ministry, oftentimes it's the people who are around you that really either help to, to raise the level of what's possible or to, to set the limit for, for what's possible. Um, you know, because like none of us are able to do it alone, right? It just, it just, it takes so much ministry requires so much. And at, at this level, when you are the person who is giving leadership, it, it demands a lot of you. And so when you, when you don't have people you can count on who, who are part of your, uh, uh, mission critical team, like not like everybody, like every, every 12, listen, the 12 of us or the 15 of us, right? Jesus's core, core group. Um, and of course, you know, there are tentacles that, that feed down into the community from there. And so Peter's got a community and, and, and John has a community um, because you like, even, even as a leader, like not everyone is connected to you in that way. Like some people are connected to other influencers. And so as the leader, if you have influence with the person who has influence, you have influence with the person who's not your person, right? right? And so it's, it's, it's critical to, to, to have uh, those people around you who, who can reach into the community and touch where you can't touch. And like, I, I think re regardless of the size of the community, and I, like I've, I've only ever led um, a mega church. So, so I'm, I'm not really sure of, of how it works with smaller churches, but here's what I do know. The people are the same. Yes. The issues are the same. Yes. The challenges are the same. The BS is the same. Like all of that stuff is the same. The quote unquote magnitude of the church does not change that. The last piece, I think for me, that, that's been critical for me in my role is to give what I have as, uh, as a shepherd, if you will. And what I have is, is love for the people uh, I am there to lead right? In sharing that love and in giving of myself in that way, I believe we have been able to uh, harmonize, as we say, and, and, and attract and bind in some ways that's given us the ability to really move what was a, a broken church in 2011, right? From, like, I, I, I assume the pastor on the heels of, of the split, right? As a, as a matter of fact, I, I, like I was, I was part of the architecture of the split, like to be perfectly candid and to, to, to then have to be responsible um, for coming in and then creating an environment that could facilitate the healing, right? Much like when a doctor uh, puts, a, puts a cast on a broken bone is so that the environment will support the healing. And yeah. one, of my, one of my main responsibilities uh, early on was to really just to be able to create the environment that could support the healing of broken hearts, the healing of disappointment, the healing uh, of broken trust. You know, like, like lots of things get, get sideways, lots of relationships get lost when, um, when, when churches fight. And so being someone who's, who's just kind of natural, again, disposition is loving, helped me to be able to speak frankly and forcefully, uh, but also lovingly to folks who were on different sides of the same issue, but who were now coming back together um, to at least give ourselves an, a, a shot at being a single community of faith again. And obviously like some people, you know, like I don't work for some people, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I, I think it was Sam Chan who said, if you, you know, if you, if you, if you lead at least at the, the, the best you can hope for is nine out of 10 people will be for you. But 
there's at least one person who, <laughs> who you are not their cup of tea, you're not their flavor, they don't want you, they don't want to hear it, um, you know, and so right. just, just recognizing that even as you give yourself um, you're not going to be for everybody. Everybody is not going to be for you. And uh, you really just have to, to be okay and comfortable and good with those folks that you kind of are sent to um, and know that there is a rightful place for those folks that you are not sent to. There's someone who they have a hearing for. They might be in your church or they might not, the people they have a hearing for. If they do have a hearing for, then they might be able to take their class or they might be able to be a part of their group. And if they don't, they might have to find the place where, uh, where they can be at home and be with um, a leader they can follow. Yeah. Wow. You said a mouthful. And I mean, I just want to, I just want to touch on a couple of those things. It's really interesting that people think that somebody can imitate somebody else. I remember I was sitting in the audience in, um, in Oprah, one of her sessions when she was in Chicago because Reverend Michael had brought me and a couple of other people into the audience because he was a guest on there. And somebody said something about being like Oprah and she was like, well, nobody can be me, but me, I got that covered. <laughs> and I just cracked up so loud that Oprah turned away from her guest and looked into the <laughs> audience. Right? Because that's just so crazy that people think that that's possible. And then the other thing that you mentioned, and this is this is very can very much candor, for you sharing that um, in terms of the the um, the splitting of of CUT, because you know I would get trickle down scuttle, but you know I had my own church to deal with, and mm -hmm. you know all of a sudden people from CUT would show up, and I thought, okay, this is interesting, and then you know you'd hear different little things along the way. But of course, that makes you the right person to to pull everything back together, right? I think that, um, yeah, and I, I appreciate, you know, your integrity in terms of, you know, meeting Johnny and saying, well, this is what it takes. And, you know, and for her to acknowledge your your talent and your leadership is is beautiful. And and then the other thing is what stands out for for me so much is your loving energy and i just so appreciate that so much and i i seek to to carry that much and exude that much love as you do so i just want to acknowledge you for that all right well thank you i received that and uh anything i can do any way i can support you either in in developing or unleashing that you know consider me a resource um, but when it when to go back to to the the notion about our our need to to have people suppress themselves so that we can be more comfortable like that's really what that is right yeah, um, yeah. and it's, it's and like we we identify so thoroughly with certain aspects in our life and like let's just face it for for some people church their church is is the place where their social life is um it's the place where they are the boss um it's the place where they have influence it's the pay place where they're well known like all of these all of these different expectations are brought into this one center this one temple this one space this one shared space and we we like we don't realize that expectations that aren't communicated are likely to be unmet right and so most people don't say i need you to be like now some people do like some people will come right out and say you know like we 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 did this and and this worked and like you should not try you, you should not try to reinvent that I'm like well i'm not trying to reinvent it but it's not authentic to how i roll Right, like you're you're asking me to roll somebody else's will, and do we not trust God enough to equip um, Joshua in much the same way that He equipped Moses? Like, is it is God so forgetful that that He can make Moses um, elaborate enough to be able to handle the responsibilities, but 
Joseph and all the people with Joseph, like they don't deserve the same thing. Like we just have our preferences. We, we love who we love. And, and again, I have like, I'm, I'm, I'm biased on behalf of my teachers. Any teacher who has ever poured in uh, and helped me and supported me, like the way I feel about them can't even really be put into words. And they could have been jerks to me. They could have, and fortunately for me, this is not my experience. Like most of my, most of my experiences with my teachers were incredibly healthy and incredibly fulfilling. Uh, so I think that adds to why I feel about them the way that I do. But, but even in those times where, where I've had experiences with teachers and those experiences didn't always go well, I'm still fond of my teachers for what they poured into me. Absolutely. Now imagine a Johnny Coleman who poured into most of her people for 50 years. Right. Right. That's the, the average time spent in the pastorate is five years. Mm -hmm. Right. 50 years, the same minister. Right? right. Helping you become the best version of yourself. Of course, there is some deep emotional psychological ties there. Of course, there's an incredible amount of love there, right? There, there, there is more there than, than I think most of us even stop to contemplate. And so when you get, when you get this Johnny come lately, who is not the same person who's been blessing you for 50 years, like Johnny come lately, you just have to know, like this, this comes <laughs> with the territory. Like you, so who, whoever, whoever the person is assuming the leadership role, they better know that. Like whoever succeeds me, he or she better know. And fortunately, like I believe I'll have an opportunity, I believe I'll have an opportunity to prepare them uh, and prepare the people, right? Like TD, T, 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 not TD Jakes, T.O. Barrett said to me, like it's, it's the leader's responsibility to prepare uh, their people for their transition. Right. Yeah. It's not the it's not the new person's responsibility. It's the leader's responsibility because you already have influence. Those are already your people. Uh, they already listen to you. They already love you. If you say to them, we, we're going to need to be able to do A, B and C and our goals are X, Y and Z, then they receive that differently than person new saying, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here now. <laughs> Guys, let's 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 get the moving, you know. So um, so I like I, I got it. And fortunately, Fortunately, Rev, I was able to come in eyes wide open, right? Um, and I long studied people. I've long studied success. Like I, I, I love psychology and philosophy, so I study human behavior. And so, I, like I, I wasn't surprised by any of it. My really, my biggest challenge is that, unfortunately, I just I, I do come heart first. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I come open, which means I'm, I'm subject to take shots when I'm not prepared to take shots just because I came open, yeah. you know, but you, you, you learn and people that you, that you cannot be open with, you, you, you close that up so that those vulnerabilities aren't there. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's the dance because you know, you're naturally an open-hearted person, but wow, that hurt. And, ooh, do I want to open up again? Yeah, I've got to, but ooh. <laughs> except, except, like, just not with, just not with you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, when, when a person shows you who they are, believe them, that uh, Angela Maya, right. uh, and Maya Angela, Maya Angela, yeah, that's when, when they show you, believe them so that you at least don't have to take that shot again. Uh, without, you know, being able to defend it or deliver your own. Now, you said something one time, because, you know, CUT has been my, you know, my in-between church mm -hmm. when Johnny was alive, when I was visiting Chicago and living in Southern California. And, and since you've been there and I, I watch occasionally or even just excerpts or bits of, of service from time to time. One time you said, I'm changing. And I thought, okay. This is an interesting move. And I was, I think I was in Northern California then when you said that. And I thought, okay, I get that a minister grows on the, con on the congregation. And I get that there may be a push for change, but your saying that meant something. And I think you 
wanted to convey something. What is it that you were conveying when you shared that with them? So if I'm if I'm recalling if I'm recalling the the time you're speaking about, uh, and I like I would alert my I would alert my my team like my mission critical people when when I could feel myself moving into a growth growth spurt, mm -hmm. I would I would let them know like I'm heading into a growth spurt. Yeah. Um. So that they know when when my patterns change or uh, if my if my mood is changing or if my level of urgency is different or if my uh, level of intensity is different, uh, at least the people I'm kind of in in the foxhole in the trenches with, they know what that is, right? Mm -hmm. And so now they even without me saying it, when they see it, um, because all of uh, just about all of my mission critical folks. Like they've been, it's, it's, they've been with me for almost as long as I've been giving leadership in the role. Mm -hmm. um, and so now they can see it. Sometimes they even anticipate it. Like they, they kind of, they kind of know how to flow with it. What if, if it's the experience that I think you're referring to, uh, that was really just one of those opportunities where, again, I was giving myself permission to, to be authentically where I was in that season. Yeah. Right. Like. For instance, culturally, um, you show up at CUT a particular way, right? Whether whether that is the uh, the senior minister or people who are uh, chairing, there was a certain look that was synonymous with the brand of CUT, right? Yeah. Well, just in terms of the the integrity of my soul and the integrity of a moment for me that's not where i always was right and like sunday mornings require such an incredible level of purity and focus that it was challenging to to play to what the cultural expectation was when just internally that's not where i am right you know what I'm saying? And so we're gonna have to reconcile this, right? And so really this, this, this is me saying, we're gonna have to reconcile these changes that I'm going through. Because what I don't want to be trying to do on Sunday morning is filter what's flowing through me because I'm not no. in the energy with the moment. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I'm not, I'm not true, I'm not true to me. If I can't be true to me, I'm not gonna be true to you. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I'm not being honest with me, then I'm not going to be honest with you. Right. And so I, I, I wanted to be able to stay in the flow of the honesty and the integrity and the truth, not just of the presentation, because it's like, it's, it's, the, it's the, when you, when you drink glass from a, when you drink water from a, from a glass, like it's, you bring that whole thing with you. You don't just pull the water and have the water. You take the, you take the whole vessel and you, you, the whole vessel is a part of the experience, right? right? So it's, it, it was that thing, it was that thing for me. And I, like, I didn't want to be a vessel that was leaking, even if the leak was something as seemingly insignificant as how I was most comfortable showing up, right? So my expectation internally versus the cultural expectation, and those things are clashing. And what I'm, what I'm basically what I'm saying to the people is, right, so I'm changing and, and I'm done having that internal clash. Now you all have to reconcile the clash. So when I show up in ways that are inconsistent with what you expect, I want you to be able to, to do the work to reconcile that, right? And I hope that it does not mean that we can't grow forward together but I understand if it if it does, you know what I'm saying. Like I, I understand if 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 my uh, if my jacket and t-shirt offend you, um, or if my no tie offends you, I understand. Now, you, like now, you gotta reckon, you gotta reconcile that because I already have, yeah. right? And so it was it was just it was just those those sorts of things where where again like 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 in order it to be accepted in community. Uh, there are some things about yourself that you silence or suppress, right? Um, if they're still a natural part of your walk, and when they resurface, 
do you continue to suppress those just so you can be accepted, right? Because I like I didn't I didn't want to be suppressing myself so I could be accepted, right? Right, and 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 like just real talk, like, and I was also aware that that could mean well, you know, maybe maybe you want somebody else. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like if I if I have to fit into if I have to fit into this box of what the expectation is, and that's not where I am, then like maybe we need a, a larger, fuller, uh, broader conversation about about how we go forward together. You know what I'm saying? Um, because I'm I'm intending to be in integrity for as long as I'm here. Beautiful. Thank you. So now this transformation that you've been describing is likely God directed. And so this is mystic magic. And so I have to ask you, what is your favorite mystical moment when you realize that you were not merely an earthly creature, but you transcended into oneness, even if it was a short period of time, it, it could have happened in a scripture or a talk or a life experience that confirmed your visceral understanding of what it means to embody a Christ consciousness. What comes to mind when you think uh, of it? So it was, it was, I believe it was actually an experience before I was uh, in the pastor, right? Maybe even before I was seriously in church. Um, and so there were really kind of, there were really kind of two experiences. One experience was, I had, I had done something uh, really silly to jeopardize uh, an important relationship to me. And as I'm now making my way up the road, I wanted to be able to talk with someone so that they could just kind of kind of talk me through and help me through this boneheaded decision that I've made. And as I began to search my 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 data bank for who I could lean on, I kept drawing a blank. And then I heard myself saying, like, I, I, I really wish I could talk to my father. I really wish I could talk to my father. And then I heard this voice saying, here I am. Like, oh, yeah. Like, I can talk to my father, right? I, I don't I don't have to have a temporal being to talk to. Yeah. Uh, I don't have to go outside of myself to to find a way to be okay. I can talk to my father. Yes. And so that that really was a paradigm shift for me because I didn't have to go outside of myself. And it, it, it also shifted then how I started to advise others because I knew that the true, pure source of knowing was in me. And in much the same way that it's in, well, not much the same way, like it's in me, it's in you, yeah. right? And so that was, that was one experience for me that was, that was really uh, paradigm shifting. The other was when I was in the Navy and preparing to become an officer and a dentist. Uh, I had been through three or four rounds of interviews with my, with my, with the officers who were above me. I've got, like, I've got, I'm signed off. I think I had been through the round of interviews with my commanding officer. I'm signed off. I'm, I'm ready to go. Like, I'm picking schools. It's between UCLA on the West Coast or Howard on the East Coast. I know it's going to require an, a six-year commitment. Uh, once I'm all done with school, Officer Wells sounds good. Officer Candidate School is going to be dope. Like, I'm ready to go. And I have this dream. And in this dream, I am uh, surrounded by people. In the, in the stadium, there's, there's darkness in the back of the stadium. It reminded me uh, a lot of Lakewood. And like, I, I don't know what Lakewood is at the time. Uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm in the unchurched phase. I, I was actually in the Navy at the time. 
uh, probably in my in my second year, in my in my first or second year of being in the Navy. And I have this vision and I see myself speaking to to the crowd and I come to know in this vision that that this is right for me. Right. And this is like this is my calling. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. But I got this other plan underway. So I try and reconcile to myself like so maybe that means I'll be talking like one off to the people who are in my chair. You know, you get a patient in the chair, captive audience, um, whatever it is I'm supposed to be saying or or teaching. Because like like I, I don't I don't have a at that time, I don't have a context for for doing ministry, right? I, at that point in time, I had only been at CUT for about a year, um, you know. So I, I was not in any classes. I haven't, I, at that point in time, I, I don't have a context for myself doing ministry. I only have a context of having briefly been a part of ministry, mm -hmm. you know, and so, but I, but I could see that I am teaching and ministering and inspiring. Like that's, that's just kind of, it's what's happening in the space. And again, like I'm working on this other plan. So like God, how do we collapse these things into one? And lo and behold, uh, it was it was not to be. And I abandoned the uh, become a dentist, which which is really like you, you talk you talk about um, you talk about taking on the dreams of the people who love you. Uh, like I really don't have the stomach <laughs> to be to to be in anybody's anything. I'm, 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 I'm not going to do well with that. That's going to be, Celeste, that's going to be a mess, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm just not, I'm not built that way. You know, mm -hmm. trying to cut chicken and, and it, it, I get squeamish. Put a, a, a worm on the hook, I get squeamish. Like, that's, that's, that's not my bag. But that was a dream that my aunt had for me. And I could see a future in it, right? I, I could see, like, I've, I've always been interested in, in making a good life for myself. The thing about transformation, the thing that transformation did for me is it made me invested and interested in helping other people make a better life for themselves. Yeah. And so I, I, I gave up, I gave up my dentist, my dentist boy dreams and really just kind of began to narrow my focus on spiritual principles and spiritual development and personal development and success principles and uh, psychology and philosophy and the study of religion. Like I just, I just started to study the, uh, the improvement of self and the rest, as they say, is, is history. Great. Well, now that we've talked about history, let's talk about what's coming up in the future. I know that our audience wants to find out more about you and how to find you and hear you and experience you what's coming up or what publications or or writings do you want to share with our international audience uh so the first the next book that i think will be out will be uh the ebook that i'm giving away uh, six keys to design your life that book is connected to a e-course that i'm developing i was supposed to actually travel next week to, to do some recording in Philadelphia, uh, but that got, that got rolled back. Uh, so I've got, I've got my e-course coming where I'm excited about the opportunity to be able to support the, the growth and development of how we intentionally design our lives, but I can, I can be able to support you as you go through and you can be able to do it at your own pace, at your own leisure, um, and just plug in and get it, get it when you, when you need to. And then, my coaching gives me the ability to support you if you need support on the other side of that. My memoir, so I turned 50 uh, earlier this year, and I was doing uh, a memoir that, that, was, that I, I had a, uh, a sneak peek ready to distribute at my 50th birthday celebration. That was in March. Well, what happened at the middle of March? COVID. <laughs> yes. So, so that plan kind of got real. 
Uh, so me, me and the developer of, of Sirius Radio uh, had, to, had to adjust our schedules because there were two global challenges that kind of threw off our timeline. So, I'm, so I'm recalibrating that work to get the memoir uh, up and out, and really just just building in some systems at this stage to to give me an opportunity to support those people who uh, who have a hearing and who could use some support and have someone serving them as they are becoming the next best version of themselves, mm-hmm. but they don't have any desire to do it through a church through a spiritual paradigm, they, you know, they're committed to how it is they get better, but they're just not coming onto this lane to do it. And so I want to, I want to be able to do my part to support the growth, the betterment, the improvement of, um, of those people who, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sent to. Yeah. Good. Wonderful. All right. And then we always know we can find you at cutemple.org. For sure. Christ Universal Temple. We rock in, uh, all, all week long, really. Uh, yeah. you, you, can, you can get us Monday through Friday uh, at 12 noon for our uh, noonday inspiration lessons. I have to shout out my guy, Reverend Rod Norton, uh, mm-hmm. who, who has his own thing, but he's a part of the CUT family. He has his mm-hmm. metaphysical Bible study uh, through the Empowerment Center Facebook page. That's on 645. That's at 645 on Tuesday evenings. Uh, I have to shout out my other guy, Reverend Galen McDowell, who has uh, Truth Transforms, the Uni- Unity Radio program really? on Wednesday morning. He uh, already talked about that. We did? He, <laughs> he did? did? Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> uh, I have a weekly a weekly broadcast, uh, Temple Talks, that, that you know, the tri- tribal folks, we get together on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, and then, of course, our live worship experience happens 10 30 a.m uh every sunday morning it's been really really wonderful to see us as we've had to adjust from the disruption of COVID, so that we could still be able to bring people um a level of excellence in ministry that could also serve as as a catalyst for their transformation so i've, I've been excited about the work we've been able to do in supporting people through these uncertain times yeah. Uh, to help bring back some sense of normalcy and stability, uh, and more importantly, to equip them uh, or to equip us to be able to navigate these these waters, these times, not just in ways that get through, uh, but where we prosper through it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you could be content or you could be happy. Why settle for being content, right? We can, we can make it through or we can prosper through. Uh, both are possibilities on the continuum of, of what's possible. Let's prosper through it, you know, let's yeah. be abundant through it. And um, so I, I'm really excited that we've been able to, to support people in uh, coming through this season in some powerful ways. We're well, doing a great job with it um, on Sunday mornings. And of course, I love Temple Talks. I can't always get there on Wednesday nights, but even if I get a couple minutes, I'm happy. All right, I see you. Yeah, and I, I, I like. I, there's certain people I can't. I can't let them. I can't let them sneak in without shouting them out. So, whatever, <laughs> you just rest assured. Whenever I see you, I'm gonna shout you out, sis. Okay. Well, I just, I just love the energy that you exude and your, your availability, and I love your consciousness and. You know, I just appreciate that you allow yourself to be a conduit for spirit and that um, that you do so with such a lightness of being. And so I appreciate you very much. And so thank you for coming on Mystic Magic. Thank you for having me. It was a great time. I knew it would be. And, and I want to encourage you to keep up the great work. Um, I want you to know that we see you like all over uh, I was just talking with someone not long ago, and he was sharing that how he was working with you, and I, I just remarked, I'm like, man, that sister is making impact all over the place. And so thank you for your light. Uh, thank you for your example. Thank you for your courage and commitment and for the ways you continue uh, to, yes, let God use you um, so that we can all be better uh, because of the work that you are doing. So keep up the great work. Um, I just want you to know um, you, you have no idea how far your impact 
uh, has gone, um, but it, it, it is moving and we're all better. So thank you for all you're doing. Okay, you're the first guest that made me cry. Okay, well, I'm gonna end the show. A yalla moment, right on. <laughs> this is Mystic Magic, exploring our spirit to understand our lives. To be real is the deal, and to heal is the real. Purpose I came to be. Vision I came to see, passion inside of me. Embodying the vision is my decision. It's who I'm led to be. It's who I came to me. Passion is what I feel when I am being real. Purpose is why I do what I do, how I do, when I do, where I do. For mine to do is the cue and it's all new. Get it in the pew. Taste it in the roux, feel it in the woo, but know it's the vision, the passion, and the purpose of you. Thank you for tuning in today. My name is Celeste A. Frazier, and this is Mystic Magic. Please check our show notes for more information about today's episode. Please subscribe. It's free. If this show has been of any benefit to you, I invite you to support the show. Please tune in for our next episode when our next guest is Reverend Jeffrey Kealoa Ryan. And my topic is live consciously. It'll be a great show. Mystic Magic can also be found on Apple Podcasts, Google, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, and many other great podcast venues. This is Mystic Magic, exploring our spirit to understand our lives. Mm -hmm.